Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Edgar Peterson. I'm the curator of the series, and I'm also the director of the African Center for Cities that is convening the Reframe webinar conversation series. We're doing this in partnership with the Alfred Herrhausen Gesellschaft, with Dark Matters Lab, Peak Urban, and the Gothenburg Center for Sustainable Development. We're deeply appreciative of their support and partnership. Now, this is the third in a series of five conversations. Uh, the first one, we had um, two fantastic speakers. We had uh, Carlos Lopez and the mayor of Freetown to reflect with us on the larger picture. What is the stakes in both understanding and dealing with urbanization in Africa? Last week, we turned to the political economy issues. And part of this was to make sure that we were upfront about just how complex and how powerful this agenda is. That in, and unless we are able to speak explicitly about the political constraints of the policy landscape, both at a continental level, at a national and at a local level, we're not going to do ourselves any favors. This week, we are focusing on, if you will, the heart of the matter. Now, to prepare for this conversation series and also to allow us to have a more substantive mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and rigorous debate that is not just at the level of platitudes, we wrote a primer uh, that we hope uh, the audience and so forth will engage with both before and during and after these conversations. And in the primer, we make a case that sustainable infrastructure holds the key to both manage urbanization, but also to forge a different growth trajectory for the continent. In other words, it has a larger macroeconomic impact. Now, today we're gonna to interrogate that, and um, we've got a fantastic panel with us, and I'll introduce them in a second. Next week, we will, if you will, turn to the, in some ways, most important part of this puzzle, and that's the citizens, ordinary folk in African cities who are able, in some ways, to produce the unique form of urbanization that we have, but also come up with all kinds of innovations and all kinds of experiments that we believe hold the key to develop systemic policy responses to the larger challenges. And again, I invite you to join us next week. We've got an amazing panel lined up as well from all corners of the continent. And then we will conclude in two weeks time with a focus on innovation systems. What, how do we curate build, invest in, and ensure that there's adequate circulation of emergent ideas around African specific innovations. Now, one of the things you'll notice when you look across the five webinars is that this is very much a pan-African conversation convened by and curated by Africans and is African speaking. And so we are deliberately trying to create a discursive space where we can take the lead in having this conversation or Stefan in forums in Berlin or in London or in New York um, and sometimes in Nairobi. Um, often enough uh, we're in the virtual space but the point is that we've got African minds convened here together and I'm personally extremely excited by it and the conversations we've had today just demonstrates what a difference it makes to have people who have a, a groundedness uh, contribute to this. Now this question of sustainable infrastructure that we're reflecting on today it's a really tough nut to crack. Why is this? Of course infrastructure is expensive. It's, it takes an enormous amount of resources to get the stuff in the ground and even more to maintain and ensure that it functions across its life cycle. Now, of course, in the African context, one of the similarities we share across most of our spaces is that our urban form and particularly its material infrastructural underpinnings is a product of colonial rule. And most of our cities were designed and infrastructures were, were fabricated to ensure that the colonial power could fulfill its ambitions. And in the post-colonial era, for a variety of reasons, that's of course too complex to get into now, the de facto assumptions that underpinned infrastructure investment, the modernist project that sat behind it, remained intact. And so what we've seen is a dramatic expansion of urban populations, 
the extension of urban areas, but a core infrastructural footprint that remained largely unchanged. And so what we see across most of our cities on the continent is this duality. On the one hand, you've got the city that services the middle class, uh, sort of large private sector firms, the elites, if you will, that operates like most modern cities anywhere in the world. And then you've got the majority condition where people get access to bits and pieces of the modern city, but they generally have to fend for themselves. They've got to improvise, they've got to rely on hybrid institutions and mechanisms to ensure they get access to basic services and they can reproduce their families, their businesses, and their aspirations in the city. Now, the challenge we have is that when these infrastructural deficits are addressed, the people who have the money, who can contribute and invest into the building of these infrastructure systems, they've got a set of criteria that has to be met before an infrastructure project is considered bankable, before it is considered that it's sufficiently low risk to invest into. And our argument that we make in the primer is that this is reinforcing the wrong kind of infrastructural lock-in. That in many places, our energy systems reproduce uh, a form of extraction of natural resources that is simply not viable for a low carbon economy. The way we deal with water systems, again, uh, tends to adopt mechanisms that is not adequately aligned with nature-based solutions. And so we can go through all of the different sectors. And in fact, we provide a typology in the paper looking at energy, water, sanitation, waste, and transport. And we try and reflect what is the status quo at the moment and how can we begin to think about evolving a more sustainable, labor-intensive, materially efficient set of systems that is appropriate to our landscape, appropriate to our climate, appropriate to our socioeconomic needs, which of course is predominantly employment. Now, what we've done is to assemble an amazing panel that can really allow us to get into the thick of this. And the idea is, you know, not for all of us to agree with each other, but to bring very different perspectives to bear on uh, the, these questions. And firstly, we're going to build on the discussions of the last two weeks um, by asking uh, Dr. Edla Miemeru, who's the chief of, Ur of the urbanization section at the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, to share with us some, pers some perspectives from their vantage point. UNECA has bought into the argument that sustainable infrastructure is key. They've released a couple of reports over the last five years that draws the link between macroeconomic reform and sustainable infrastructure investments and how that connects with an agenda of green industrialization. And so there isn't really a better place person to bring that macro perspective into the frame. The second speaker this afternoon will be Stefan Achia, who is the manager for the urban division at the African Development Bank, the money bags, I should say. Um, Stefan has a deep uh, background in engineering and in transport planning and transport management in particular. He's cut his teeth uh, with various ministries uh, of the government of Mauritius. Um, and is currently responsible for growing the urban division within the African Development Bank, which if it's, it, yeah, if, I, I don't know, Stefan, if this is fair, but it's always been a little bit of a stepchild within the ADB. And I think uh, you've been entrusted with, uh, with making it a, a fully fledged sibling uh, within the ADB family. And welcome and thank you for joining us today. Our third speaker then hails from Beni. Uh, Claude Bonner, who is the MD and the Chief Innovation Officer of Seme City. Um, this is, as far as I understand, and I don't know if my geography is going to trip me up, but it's just outside, we're at the edge of Conakry, uh, but it is meant to service the whole country. Uh, and, um, and this is a presidential initiative, and she was um, basically recruited, uh, or should I say seduced in 2016, uh, to bring this vision uh, into uh, the presidency of Benny and to see it from conceptualization to operationalization. Now, we thought it was really important to bring uh, an, an emerging experiment, a real world example of where people are grappling with these questions and trying to figure out what does it mean to pursue a sustainability agenda, but at the same time, focus on entrepreneurship, focus on education, focus on research, focus on building a new kind of economy. 
And so welcome, Claude, and it's wonderful that you can join us today. And then finally, um, another person from the finance sector. We've got Leslie Nglovo, who is recently appointed as the CEO of the African Risk Capacity Limited. And he'll say a little bit more about what that is. Sounds super impressive, Leslie. So thanks for, I'm sure you must be very busy. So thanks for making time to join us. He was formerly the CEO of, of um, Exeter Africa Specialist Risks. And, uh, and is a chartered accountant by training. So we've got a fantastic mix of disciplines and professions, geographer, accountant, engineer, uh, and an entrepreneur business studies expert. Um, so I'm pretty sure we're gonna have a fantastically rich and exciting conversation. Now, um, the format is I'm gonna ask uh, Edlam to kick us off. Um, we'll then go straight to the second speaker, who's Stefan, and then we'll pause and then have 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A on their specific inputs, and then we'll do the last two, and then we'll open up uh, for a broader conversation. Again, welcome everyone, and to remind folk that we are recording this and live streaming it on Facebook, um, so if you want to tweet that out while you're listening. And then the previous uh, conversations we've had is on the ACC YouTube channel, so that can also be uh, visited if um, if you weren't able to join us there. So thanks again for making time, being with us, and Edlam, the floor is yours. You're still muted? Yes. Can you hear me now? We can hear you clearly. Thanks. Okay, thank you. I was trying to unmute myself. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that, um, um, Edgar. And uh, I do appreciate the opportunity to be part of these uh, very essential and timely conversations uh, about urbanization in Africa, um, which is, of course, reshaping the continent at a pace, scale, and level of complexity that we have not witnessed uh, before in the region, but uh, one can also say elsewhere. Uh, in the world. Uh, so one of the questions that we have been asked to address uh, in these conversations is what to do differently in order to really move the urban agenda forward in meaningful ways. And so um, my own sense is that the recognition that cities are central for Africa's economic transformation has gained uh, quite some uh, currency and prominence in recent years and is becoming a more common framing for the urban agenda in the region, including, as we know, the Agenda 2063 and a growing body of knowledge products and analysis. However, uh, I would also say that to a large degree, this is yet to translate into action at a scale and pace uh, to match the enormity of the urban transition. And this is partly why we heard to, where, why we are here today is to consider you know, what are, the, what are the ways and means to reframe the urban agenda so that it moves forward meaningfully in measurable ways? I want to talk about three things uh, in this regard uh, before coming to the specificities of, uh, you know, the industrialization agenda and uh, the greening of that agenda. For me, the first is the need uh, to, uh, if I can use the language of, of the conversation series, to reframe economic policy making and apply a strong urban lens to economic policy making. Although the role of cities as drivers of growth, of economic growth, is a common declaration that we hear these days, the urban dimension is often completely absent or weak as countries are defining their priority economic goals and investments. And so for cities to indeed be seen as necessary economic game changers and to be positioned at the core of economic policy making, I think the magnitude of what is at stake needs to be clear. And, and let me highlight some of what I, what I feel is at stake and what we know is at stake. So in a continent facing rapid economic growth and a fat youth population, the creation of productive jobs is of utmost priority. It is the top priority in the continent, in my opinion. Of course, one, un one can unpack what that actually means. In this regard, in regards to creating productive jobs, what is clear is that the economic sectors that will create those productive jobs for Africa at the level and scale that we need are primarily manufacturing um, and tradable services. And these sectors are largely urban-based. 
And so we're talking about urban-based sectors being the main sectors where we expect productive jobs to be created in Africa. In addition, the population that will require jobs in Africa is increasingly urban. It's already urban in many countries. And so in a decade, a little over a decade, about 14 years or so, most Africans that require those productive jobs will be located in cities. And so in a sense, it is in urban areas that Africa will create the jobs it needs, and it is in urban areas that those jobs will be needed. So that's, that's, that's one sort of a point around what is at stake here. A second point for me is that when we think about another top priority for the continent, which is how to finance sustainable development and uh, growth, uh, we, we now know that domestic resource mobilization is really one of the uh, sort of central instruments for that. In this regard also, cities have a very critical role to play. Cities are important in increasing direct and indirect taxation for domestic resource mobilization in Africa. We know that globally across countries, urbanization and a shift away from agriculture is often associated with higher taxes as a percent of GDP. And we already know in the continent that the smallholder agriculture, which is dominant, is often difficult to tax and natural resources are very volatile. So when it comes to revenues as well for the continent, cities and urbanization are at the core of that agenda. Again, really trying to understand what is at stake here. Another core issue that demonstrates what's at stake is regional trade and integration. The African continental free trade area uh, is, is now uh, sort of you know, a major uh, framework through which the continent hopes to transform itself economically. And here too, urbanization, changing and emerging urban geographies have huge implications for regional trade and integration. Firstly, urbanization generates very strong demand in a variety of goods in sectors, especially manufacturing, where regional trade is likely to be competitive. And the geography of cities and their linkages also plays a role in how and whether African countries take advantage of regional trade. In turn, regional trade itself will create new geographies, new transboundary urban regions, uh, as, as, as trade and integration um, um, advances. And so I've, I've tried to highlight three top questions for the continent where cities have a profound impact. Job creation, revenue mobilization, regional trade and integration. And so my own sense is that while we say that cities are drivers of economic growth, do we really understand what's at stake and do we really bring them into the sort of policy frameworks and investments related to those priorities. A second issue for me related to the above, and this is where it gets more practical, is when you look at national development plans and strategies of African countries, urban is often very weak, or it is uh, sort of captured in a silo disconnected from economic sector policies and priorities. So national development planning is now a major instrument for economic growth and transformation. But in many instances, urbanization is still viewed from a functional, narrow, sectoral perspective in national development planning, divorced from economic priorities, divorced from the key infrastructure investments that are prioritized in national development planning. And so um, while sector and subnational development strategies can address urban issues, the role of national development planning in coordinating the infrastructure investments that countries need to really uh, sort of propel their cities uh, to, to be fit for purpose uh, is really defined in national development planning. So that's another core area where we need to think about you know, how are cities framed? What are the priorities that are set for cities in national development planning? And in turn, how does, how does that impact budgets and investments and infrastructure in cities? Because in a sense, that is the main uh, compass. National development planning is the main compass for economic uh, policy making and infrastructure planning and investments. A third area for me, which is again linked to the first two, is the urgency of applying an urban lens to national and subnational infrastructure investments. So I think we do agree that infrastructure is of critical central importance, but for a rapidly urbanizing continent, infrastructure planning needs to integrate a clear urban lens. And in a sense, if I can call it in this way, 
we need more urban responsive infrastructure investments. And what does this mean, urban responsive infrastructure investments? Some of the elements are as follows. First, it needs to prioritize and enable the functioning and productivity of cities to make cities fit for purpose for the industrialization that we're pursuing, for the agricultural modernization that we're pursuing. And here, it's about being explicit that urban is a core priority in infrastructure investment frameworks. And I want to um, uh, highlight here that when we talk about infrastructure investments uh, in this conversation, there is the within city infrastructure conversation, the infrastructure investments that we need within cities to address city level demand, city level uh, barriers and city level uh, requirements for infrastructure. But there is also a second dimension, which is looking at the national productive infrastructure that is required for cities to function better. So there is the within city, but beyond the city, one can call it the national productive infrastructure. So in both these areas, we need to apply a strong urban lens and make it much more urban responsive. A second area, um, Edgar, you spoke about the cost of infrastructure. Yes, the cost of infrastructure are very, very high. But what we see in a number of instances in our continent also is that it's not just a lack of resources, but it's also suboptimal investments of available resources, which leads to low returns on investment and uh, sort of low, low impact. And cities and spatial targeting of infrastructure investments offers enormous opportunities. So strategically targeting infrastructure investments in areas of high return is of um, primary importance. And many of these productive advantages are located in cities. So we see in many instances where infrastructure investments are very poorly coordinated with spatial um, dynamics and trends with the development of cities, the location of cities, and how those cities can offer um, advantages that would allow for higher returns of investment of, of infrastructure uh, in our countries. I can take the classic case of special economic zones, uh, sort of a very important um, economic instrument that many countries in Africa are trying to uh, apply and, um, and uh, utilize for economic growth. But the locational challenges and the weak uh, linkages with urban development dynamics, with spatial development, is often a cause for failure for special economic zones. So that's just one example of how if we were to better coordinate investments of infrastructure in space, we could actually um, uh, enable higher returns uh, of infrastructure investments. So having said this, I think with these kind of conceptualizations of urbanization in relation to infrastructure, in relation to economic planning, then it becomes uh, sort of uh, easier and clearer to make a strong link between urbanization and green industrialization. I think one point I want to make, and this is often uh, sort of uh, sometimes uh, there are questions asked about this, but Africa must industrialize. And this is clear, this is clearly set in Agenda 2063, and it is an agenda that most countries are pursuing. And within that pursuit of industrialization, I think the other thing that's, that's really clear uh, is that um, that industrialization must be green, it can be green uh, as well. And so part of the green industrialization agenda is dispelling the myths currently around green growth and how it will uh, you know, potentially impact or undercut, undercut economic growth. And so investing in environmentally and green, um, environmentally favorable and green industrialization should be seen not as an obstacle to competitive manufacturing, but as underpinning competitiveness, making more efficient use of energy, you know, decoupling resource use from output growth, and so on and so forth. So the two need to be seen as uh, you know, completely synergetic uh, agendas and targets that are possible to, to achieve uh, in the context of Africa. And in all of this, I mean, coming back to the agenda of urbanization in cities, Africa's green industrialization cannot be achieved without well-planned, well-managed, and well-functioning cities and urban areas. And again, I want to go back to my earlier point around, uh, you know, bringing cities to the core of economic planning, to the core of green industrialization, and to the core of some of the top priorities uh, for the continent, uh, Edgar. So uh, let me leave it at that. And uh, I think uh, that's enough ground for us to, to engage further.
over to you. Great, thanks, Sedlam. Appreciate the comprehensive nature and the clarity of your inputs. Um, so just to say, and building on um, the conversation of last week in particular, um, how do we, and not for you to answer now, but to reflect on, and then also there's some comments in the chat box um, that you can maybe look at while Stefan is speaking and, and return to when we come to Q&A. But of course, having good plans and policies is really important, but there's a, um, if you will, a governance legacy that we sit with, that there's often a disjuncture between formal plans and policies and how decision-making actually happens because of the ways in which um, the state is used for rent seeking. So maybe just to sort of uh, extend your thought about not just what should live within these, but also how do we make them real? How do we make them something that the government feels that it should be held accountable to implementing? Um, and then if I can just ask you to just reflect on some of the comments that we've got in the chat box in the meantime, and then without further ado, I'll give over to Stefan and get a perspective from uh, the African Development Bank on how they see this changing landscape. Thanks, Stefan, and welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Edgar, and thank you for, for the participant uh, to welcome, welcome you and uh, us in, in your homes uh, for this uh, very special time we're living in. Uh, I pre prepared a few notes, but I'd like to jump on what uh, Edlam uh, mentioned, and I think the president of the African Development Bank uh, uh, mentioned it last week in his town hall. Uh, in many ways, we have to um, challenge back our governments in the roles that the governments have versus the private sector. Um, and to make a little caricature, heaven looks like when the policies, the plans, and the programs are really taken care of by the government. That's their role, that's their responsibility. And then projects, if the cash flow is interesting and it actually can get involved, the private se sector gets in involved in the projects. Hell could actually be where the policies are done by 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 the private sector, and, and that happens. This is where you have uh, sideways policies because they are going in; a, they are favoring such and such uh, private interests, and plans are made by the private sector. So, uh, government have to go back to uh, the the basic principles of policy uh, development and research, plans and programs, and then have the right environment for the private sector to get in. And I'll go back to the reason why I'm talking a lot about the private sector, because in this post-COVID world, uh, there's a lot of stresses happening right now in, on, our, on our government budgets and municipal budgets uh, that will actually force us to change the way we do business, and especially invest in infrastructure. So with that in mind, with the, to try to kind of uh, reiterate how we are thinking here, how do we, so to speak, build back better? That's another key word uh, in this post. Uh, and what kind of infrastructure are we gonna, we gonna put in? How are we gonna do it? The, the current scene on the continent, uh, and I think Edlam has, has mentioned this a, a few, is not looking so good. Uh, uh, we've lost a massive amount of uh, GDP. Uh, and it's, uh, again, uh, the president just mentioned uh, last week, uh, we've lost 10 years of, of, uh, of uh, of uh, gains, so we have to how to get back to this uh, quickly. Uh, up, up rise in inflation. We had um, especially expansionary fiscal spending uh, on already a high fiscal deficit, and that's going to have a special impact on large infrastructure investment. Uh, so the sovereign debt burden is has increased. Uh, remittance has reduced in, in many ways, even though the the COVID situation has kind of um, uh, flattened. We expect a huge amount of uh, our fellow uh, Africans uh, going into, into poverty because of it. And many will lose, will lose their jobs. Estimated between, we estimate about 25 to 30 million. Now, it, uh, as you know, the, the, the emergency relief measures this year, 2020, has been basically uh, budget support. Uh, the African Development Bank, as well as, as many uh, development institutions have put, or we call relief funds, we have something called the CRF, the Relief Recovery Fund, uh, to come to support our Ministry of Finance 
in this very troubling time uh, with all sorts of activities for redirecting to the health, health uh, activities and so on and so forth. Part of this is also going to be the fiscal policy response, huh? uh, the cash transfers and so on and so forth. Then there will be the monetary response, uh, the ease of financial uh, conditions, uh, and the labor uh, market response. And then we can see this uh, where I'm sitting right now in South Africa uh, and in, uh, in other countries in, in the, on the continent. We are currently going, so end 2020, 2021 is going, to sh is going to show up and everybody's praying that it's going to be better than 2020. Uh, is going to be the time of recovery. And infrastructure, uh, in the eyes of a lot of leadership, is seen as part of the recovery answers. We need to build. We need to get people back uh, to work. So there'll be a need to accelerate uh, uh, reforms, uh, to, uh, to, to reform the productive base, uh, address obstacles in formalizing the economy, uh, especially on the taxation side, uh, and then rethink social protection uh, programs for maximum coverage, which is true also for, for a lot of uh, OECD countries. And then there'll be a need for balance trade-off. Huh? How, how do we go back to work for 2021? So this is, where, this is where we are for the next two, probably two or three years, uh, 2021, 2022, 2023. Uh, get the get the investment back, get people back to work, and I'll get into what what uh, what some of my ideas on the on the on the sustainable uh, infrastructure. Then will come uh, hopefully down the road something called the resilient measures. How do we make it become resilient or sustainable uh, from all of the, the various sides of our urban fabrics? Again, Africa is not a single team. It's not a one team. It's a it's a more of a league. You have the premiership, you have the second division, and you have the... So what will the South Africa, the Morocco, Kenya do? What will be doing the, the Ivory Coast? And then what will be doing the Central African Republic? It's a different, it's a different speed. So the, the answers, infrastructure answers are different. Uh, for some, it'll be very much the basic infrastructure. Others, be how to blend the private sector uh, into the development. The, the title of, of my discussion uh, from uh, ACC coming from uh, Edgar was, was a sustainable infrastructure is the key to success. I like to kind of challenge this idea and not saying about the key to success, but a, one of the key to success. Uh, on top of this, and that's one of the elements that we see, and, and we've seen it in, in many countries where we've been involved, we need to get the system right. And so far in our cities, the systems are not working right. Uh, our friend at UCGLA, UN Habitat, and others, it's the Alliance, and Edgar himself, who actually said, as well as others, maybe uh, in, this, in the panel here, we haven't got our systems right yet. Our political decentralization, as well as our, as our fiscal decentralizations, are still work to be finished. So it's a lot of activities to be done uh, under the governance side. So I would put on top of the key to success. So, uh, is the governance side. And then under it, I would put the infrastructure uh, to support the economic activities. If we don't get this, uh, and then I mean, as, as many have said, uh, I think President Obama used to say before in, in 2008, 2009, uh, a crisis is a too good of occasion to miss. If we miss this occasion to actually do some reforms on our, our, our system of governance of our cities, again, the more advanced one as well as the more basic ones, we would have missed a great occasion. Why? Because, again, as I, I said, on the overall picture, the debt burden right now is quite high. Uh, cent central governments are not, are not be able to, to borrow uh, as much as they would like to. Uh, so for all the elements when it comes to affordable housing, social housing, water, sanitation, solid waste, transport, and the rest of the activities, uh, it's going to be difficult to knock on the single source of sovereign uh, borrowing to do it. So we'll have to, uh, in many ways, us in, our, in on the continent here, we have to be double clever than the ones in OECD because we have to provide the similar kind of services, but with less resources. Uh, those who work in transport, uh, we would know that at, at, at a normal, normal junction, 
if you have X thousand of vehicle coming per hour, then you need to do a traffic light. So then if it's more, then you have to do an interchange. So whether you're sitting in Oslo, in Copenhagen, in Kinshasa, it's the same thing, a car is a car. So the question now is what the resource you have to be able to meet the objective here. And that is where the difference is. It's a, it's a, we need to meet the, the objective with less resources. So how to make them go further. Um, so this is where where the the thinking now is is uh, is uh, is uh, is working with uh, with our countries is how do we build back better uh, on on it within the infrastructure. Um, we, the, the president of the bank has has asked us again to to engage with countries to make sure that central government looks after what central government should be looking at, namely what I mentioned at the beginning, policy plans programs, and then on projects case to case basis. To look at what what can actually be be uh, 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 when the private sector can get, get involved. It's easy to talk about PPP. It's much dif more difficult to do it. And some subsectors actually are rights versus good to have. And that also goes back to the question of uh, in a city, what should be what should be the priority of the government to provide? Is water sanitation is water a right? Uh, yes. Is um, is a housing a right? Some would say yes. Uh, many, I would say yes. Um, is uh, transport something which is actually right now costing a huge amount of the revenue of the household? Is it something that needs to be a uh, right? Do we spend more money on building lanes or many for public transport? And I think this, this COVID situation has also brought a lot of attention and thinking to citizens in our urban cities uh, to, to think what are the conditions they're living in? What should be uh, the future? What should be their, their, their rights as going, uh, going forward? Uh, one of the, the questions that you'll be asking afterwards is how to um, embrace sustainable infrastructure. Uh, so we, are, uh, we meet the needs of the, of the countries. We try to meet with other MDBs to meet the needs of the countries. And uh, we can put all sorts of uh, instruments uh, at the disposal of the countries, sovereign instrument, non-sovereign instrument. Now we can actually put sub-national instrument. That means we can actually lend directly to the municipalities with or without guarantees. But that means that the risk, the management, the organization of the entity is, is done correctly, especially if without um, national or government guarantees. So, our cities right now are a bit under pressure, and they will be under more under pressure to get their acts right, make sure their, 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 their accounts are audited, that their revenue streams are fine, that they have their property rights all engaged uh, and, and set out, and that we have both the political and fiscal decentralization. So that really, uh, you bring the services to the people. Uh, and that's also something that that uh, many have actually picked up during this uh, COVID situation. That um, at the end of the day, the schools, the healthcare, the police, the garbage collector, it's all local government activities, and they need to provide this, those services. How do we scale it up? Uh, one of the things that uh, the African Bank uh, is encouraging is what we call operational discipline. What is operational discipline? We often in the past have been put in front of, a, uh, we need to build an infrastructure, but that infrastructure is not within a broader plan, within a framework. And that's always a bit, a bit, a, a bit dangerous because what happens is that we think we are going, we're moving forward, and this is actually a very interesting investment, but the, it, it's not been part of a, of a city land management or city land plan and within the various sector planning, transport plan, housing plan, water sanitation, and so on and so forth. Uh, solid waste is a massive issue that uh, all of our cities are, are looking at. Um, I'm just looking lately at the, at the numbers from Kinshasa, where the, 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 what is coming out as solid waste is what's currently being collected. We're talking about 2 3%. So what's happening every day? So all this is, show, is showing us that this, this element of planning is extremely important. And it goes back to governance. Uh, we need to have proper staff in our municipalities, uh, engineers and planners. And, and that brings comfort uh, to development partners and the private sector. 
to uh, to bring resources, uh, and and if those we know that those those projects will be able to pay, pay themselves either from the sovereign side, uh, at least uh, or the, the private side. Finally, I like to kind of point out on this issue of uh, on the element of. Uh, what is what we're looking at right now is, is trying to see what are the bulk infrastructure, again the the responsibility of government, the bulk infrastructure that needs to be financed by the sovereign side, and one of the ways that we will be looking more and more into the future is our role as as a, as a multi, multi uh, platform is to really support the bulk infrastructure had uh, as a needs. And then provide the, the the environment for the private sector uh, to to get involved, um, not the other way, the other way around. And I think that is uh, where cities are going to have to to move. Otherwise, uh, the revenue streams right now from the tax collection, the central uh, allocation to the cities, uh, are con currently under serious uh, constraint, and will not be able to meet. Uh, all the all the development needs that they, you need to have to, to do to do. Um, so I, I'll stop I'll stop uh, stop there on on this element. Um, 2021, the bank will be uh, going back full swing on infrastructure uh, investment. Uh, 2020 was we were a bit, if you want, responding to the urgent matter, which is uh, the relief uh, from the COVID situation. But as our president has mentioned, we should not go back to business as usual. We need to build back better. And this all this element of maybe we don't need to throw in the big amount of money in those large projects that, uh, that are not necessarily meeting the needs of the people. To understand more what people are asking, make sure they are part of plans uh, that are prioritized. Uh, and that should and make sure that the private sector has really has a, 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 a voice, especially on the operations of the infrastructure. There's many ways we can we can uh, 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 many ways we can, can do this, and the citizens of our cities uh, are really looking forward to an improved life uh, post COVID. They they really don't want the the status quo, and I think um, uh, we need to be a lot smarter uh, going forward and uh, push our policy uh, decision makers uh, to really um, get those, in, those reforms on because the citizens are actually waiting for those. And, and then there's some great examples. We could look at Benin, we could look at, look at other countries where they've done some really good uh, reforms and they, those are delivering very, very good results. So I'll stop right there. Back to you, Edgar. Thanks, Stefan. Appreciate that. Um, so we're running a little bit behind time. So I'm just going to, um, there's one or two points I'll pick up Stefan later, but uh, maybe um, Edlam, if you could respond to some of the comments in the chat function and Stefan, I'll ask you to just, uh, while you catch your breath, uh, maybe do the same. And um, I guess sort of from the moderating position, uh, one of the comments uh, in the chat function was, you know, that this is actually fairly simple, that it is really um, about uh, health, about schools, about housing, uh, and so forth. Um, and just to say, of course, that uh, those are social development investments, those are social infrastructures, and absolutely they're critical. But how does one, the, the challenge we face is that we've got to balance social development investments, which typically gets financed off the tax base, and then make development infra infrastructure that facilitates productivity in the economy um, and this is broadband transport um, energy etc cetera, etc cetera. and then of course the big challenge is, is to think both of those systems in relation to the need to have regenerative green infrastructures right so that uh, we can deal with the carbon performance of our cities and biodiversity questions. So yes, absolutely, uh, let's not lose sight of the basics, but how do we think in more holistic terms of the different categories of infrastructures and their relationships? Um, so just in response to that one comment, but Edlam, the floor is yours. If you could pick up some of those, you don't have to respond to them individually. Thanks. Uh, thank you, um, Edgar, and also to, to the person that asked the question. Um, I, I, I think 
we need to think about them in an integrated way. The you know, these different categories of, of infrastructure and infrastructure requirements at the city scale. For me, I, I uh, think that uh, the uh, requirements to make a city perform better from an economic perspective will also generate better social outcomes and better well-being at the city scale. And let me explain why I say that. Because um, investments in uh, the economic productivity of a city and a city that functions better, that is more productive, that is better able to generate jobs, productive jobs, decent jobs, means that there will be um, benefits and advantages for households and for people that live in cities as well. So I think what is of uh, core importance is thinking about those investments that generate benefits, not only to uh, individuals and households, but equally also for house for uh, firms and businesses. I think to be very practical, if we think about transport and mobility in our cities, this is a clear case where the costs and the benefits are equally important for individuals, for households, for firms and businesses, and by implication also to the national economy. I mean, if we, we in some of our large cities in Africa, the cost, the daily costs um, to, to, to the economy of traffic congestion, of, of uh, uh, you know, um, uh, poor mobility and uh, weak transport systems is immense, it's huge. The cost is huge to the national economy, to the city economy. It's equally huge for the individual that is trying to get from one place to another, that is trying to you know, access services, that is ac trying to access jobs. And so you know, these kind of investments are advantageous, both from an economic perspective as well as from a social perspective. And again, that's where we build in the green dimension and sort of the environmentally, environmentally sustainable dimension. I think there was a reference to um, infrastructure not being expensive, I think it is expensive. And the estimates that we have uh, are around 50 to $60 billion to uh, meet the urban infrastructure investment requirements uh, for Africa. Having said that, uh, the cost of uh, investing in cities today might be high, but the cost of not investing cities is even higher. We will face even higher costs uh, if we uh, sort of do not invest in cities and uh, continue uh, in the pathways that uh, we are uh, pursuing today. Um, I don't know whether you'd want me to respond to um, any other questions, Edgar. There was really an important point around is industrialization the way forward for, uh, for Africa, for Africa's economic growth and transformation. Um, I think this is really a critical question. Um, it has been put on the table as a top priority and as a major pathway for the continent. And I would tend to say that uh, we should have a more nuanced understanding of uh, Africa's industrialization and industrialization pathway. It is different for Africa to industrialize in a different way, in a way that's green, in a way that's more sustainable, in a way that's more inclusive, and in a way that learns from, from elsewhere and is able to uh, sort of, as a latecomer, um, optimize the advantages of industrialization for the continent. But certainly looking at the scale of jobs that need to be created in the continent, the scale of economic transformation that we need, one would say that industrialization is key. And uh, in this respect also, it's about taking advantage of the resources and the, the uh, possibilities that we have in our economies. Uh, industrialization is not only about factories, you know, in the sense that we think about it, it's also about commodity-based industrialization, it's about adding value to commodities, it's about agro-processing, it's about transforming agriculture as well. So I think a more nuanced and uh, broader conceptualization and perception of industrialization is quite important as well, so that we don't get fixated on the idea of, you know, menial jobs uh, uh, sort of uh, in, the in the factory line. Over to you. Right. Thanks, Edla. Um, Stefan, there was one specific question directed towards you um, from Philip Heinrichs. Um, couldn't agree more with your point on the role of, of governments, the back to basics of planning policy and strategy question. How do you see the role of the ADB, the regional economic commissions at the continent and the continental level in this back to planning policy and strategy? Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Philip, uh, for this question. 
Um, the AFDB, uh, and as uh, as Edgar was saying, the 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 urban division, the urban side of the AFDB was not there for for the first fifty years, or something like that. Um, so we we it's only now that we're getting involved. However, the African Development Bank has been involved in the cities for a long time, but on the sector side, we were involved with roads, water, sanitation, power, uh, even supporting mortgage. Uh, um, uh, for the for affordable housing and to lessen the, the the cost of borrowing so that has been our role now we're trying to go upstream uh, up the at the governance uh, governance level uh, and how to do we manage our cities uh, because we understand not only from our, our side but talking to the, the 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 people who have been in this business for a long time especially people like UN Habitat uh, UCGLA uh, Cities Alliance, uh, the team of uh, the African Center for Cities, and others, that governance is, is really the key for, for success of, of the city. Uh, and once we kind of sort this out, then we can actually uh, increase massively the amount of infrastructure investment. That happens always. I mean, we, I come from the transport sector. Once you sort out, you just sort out the, the, the road, um, road authority, the highway authority, and you've you, you sorted out the mechanism of the highway authority, then suddenly you are rolling out millions and millions of dollars of investment. But if you're not sorting the, the, the governance out, then you know if you if you spend a couple of thousand dollars, you're 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 stuck. So basically, from the procurement side, from the uh, disbursement, uh, the the design side, everything is 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 a mess. Uh, the Rex is a very good question, Philip. I, I don't have a, 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 an answer, but somehow the Rex needs to get involved. However, you understand, you know, you know the Rex better than I do. Um, it's not so easy to get them um, and to have the capacity uh, for them to bring in, in any discussion. Maybe they need to build the capacity within the Rex. Basically, the Rex, their role, and, and you know it better than me, Edgar, you will know this. The Rex. Our main role is to link cities together within the various countries. That's what, that's what at the end, long story short, we link the cities together in a, in a particular region. We're linking Kigali to Kampala to Nairobi to Mombasa and so on to Addis and so on and so forth. Too. So that's what we're doing on that region and so on and so forth. So SADEC, same thing. So how do we, do we get that particular link right through cities? Uh, maybe Edlam would have a better answer. I don't. I don't know. Um, that's an open question, and I, um, I think I'd, I'd like to listen to have some ideas. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Stephen. Um, so I think one of the themes that have emerged, and of course, this is always the challenge when we talk at the scale of the continent, is that uh, you know when you talk about governance or policy or planning, uh, you immediately get you record by an enormous amount of nuance once you get to a specific region or to a country or a given city. Um, so I think it is appropriate that at this moment we switch scale, if you will, and invite Claude to maybe reflect from the bottom up um, what her experience of these debates have been and how do we make sense of, in some ways, the question of prioritization. Where do you start? Is governance indeed the first step? Um, and uh, and involving different stakeholders, private sector, civil society, and so on. So Claude, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Edgar. Thanks, um, thanks for inviting me to, um, to this discussion. Um, I'm actually even surprised to be invited to this discussion because I am not an expert in infrastructure at all. Um, I come from a completely different um, perspective, um, which is knowledge and innovation. So the, the project um, that I lead called Semes City um, is the International Knowledge and Innovation City. It's, um, it's conceived to be a catalyst for a knowledge-based economy in Benin. Um, and the development of that city relies on very strong partnerships with universities, schools, vocational training institution, research and development centers, um, and um, to a great extent, the private sector, um, maybe through um, smaller companies, um, startup companies, um, and of course, it involves local authorities. 
Um, so it's a government um, started project, um, but as I, I will explain a little bit how the financing is put together um, so that we can bring in very early on the private sector. So our goal, um, and I, I, I really want to stress that because when I started working on the project and started presenting to development partners, I remember um, I was in 2016, I had a meeting in, um, at the World Bank and I started talking about the project and they told me, well, we're going to make sure you understand one thing, your project is not an infrastructure project. If you think it's an infrastructure project, you will fail. Um, and that's when I need to really stress that our goal, the reason why this project um, is, um, is what it is, is we want to improve employability. We want to drive the emergence of national champions, small companies with innovative solutions. This is why we exist. And the infrastructure is enabling us to do that. So, when we, when we envision Semi City, it's a vibrant learning and innovative community that will attract people from Benin, from Africa, from beyond, um, to experiment solutions, to create a new type of entrepreneurship that, is, that can transform the lives of you know, people, that is socially impactful, that is inclusive. So we, um, we have decided where that city would be. Um, it's, uh, it's a 200 hectare project um, and it's located in um, a peri-urban area um, in Benin. Um, the, 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 the capital of Benin is not Conakry, it's Cotonou. <laughs> so it's 20 kilometers from Cotonou and it's five kilometers from the Nigerian border. And it, it really is positioned there in a very strategic position because we're in front of, uh, I know Edlam mentioned special economic zone. We're in front of a new special economic zone. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that if we have time. Um, and the plan is for the government to finance the, the road, the, the water, the, the sewage, um, and the, the networks, the, um, the connectivity, so the high-speed internet connections, um, and part of the construction of the first building, so the academic building. And then additional financing is sought for constructions of the, the rest and, and including residential. So this is a little bit of background of what um, we set up to do. Um, we started in 2016 um, working with a, a very, very good Singaporean um, urban planning company. Um, so they came in with the full arsenal of tools and global space planning guidelines and um, they applied benchmarks which maybe we should have, you know, the benchmarks were like Singapore, Australia, China, US, um, and they, um, they produced a brilliant master plan. I mean, I, 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 mean, I, I have only praise for the quality of the work they did. Um, they took into account our context, which was, you know, we have wetlands, we're near a coastal area with coastal erosions. We're in an area that used to be a protected forest of 1,000 hectares and now there are only less than 20 left to so the integrated reforestations. They also looked at, because we're on the road that goes to Nigeria, there are big highways, so they looked at all the carbon implications and also mentioned some of the social, cultural and economic development opportunities of the city. Um, so it was a perfect master plan you know the green connectors they even thought about public transport system and for people who know benin um the main um way for people to get from one point to another is um, motor bicycles and we have the taxi motor bicycles so you know public transportation for us is something that we are not um, accustomed to we have the small buses but that's it um so we, we looked at it and I remember that was 2017, we had the master plan, we actually had it approved by you know, some of the government officials, but there was just something that was not quite right. Um, it was perfect, but we were struggling to explain how this beautiful master plan on you know, piece of paper, we we're actually going to do the, the, 
the renderings and everything, how it was putting particular attention to the local problems um, that we knew that we were encountering every day when we were going on site. And also, of course, there were some serious questions about the cost of um, implementing this master plan, the, how it would adapt to our environment and, and how it would be sustainable, um, which is another issue linked to cost because it's not just constructing, it's how do you maintain the infrastructures. And so um, after 18 months, we took a very hard decision to go back to the drawing board. Um, that was a beautiful project, but maybe it was not the right one for us. So we went back and we look at it from a lens of, you know, how do we ensure that um, whatever we build, that, that knowledge and innovation city, bring concrete and sustainable improvement to the standard of living of the citizens that were living in, the, in, in the, that very urban area. Um, and also how could we do this with a lower cost structure? Because otherwise it would not have been sustainable. So we applied different set of principles. Um, we also um, look, took another hard look at the realities of the site. Um, and and I, would, I will give you a few of the, you know, some of our thinking and how it has evolved because we're still, we're still really much in the middle of it. Um, so the first thing that we did is to say, okay, we have a site with like, you know, an incredible location, you know, or have a coastal front, et cetera. It's very beautiful and it could be something that even has a touristic attraction, but it has also lots of challenges. And so let's respect our natural environment, you know, the wetland, you know, the, when you go to the site during the rainy seasons, you have water up until your knees and, you know, that's what it is. Um, so how can we minimize the impact on the environment, make our environment as resilient as possible, especially, you know, with climate change and the coastal erosion. So the, the solution that we want to apply must be different from what we've done so far, um, different from like traditional civil engineering work and that it's financially heavy, it's difficult to maintain. Um, how can we think differently? And, and if we call ourselves a knowledge and innovation city, then how do we involve our knowledge and innovation community, our startups, our research um, um, centers, to build something that actually makes sense and is relevant to us and, and really has impact um, to the local communities? So for example, I'm gonna give you a couple of examples. Um, for the, um, the hydraulic systems, we thought about um, doing more open air management of, um, of you know, the um, um, hydraulic systems as opposed to doing the traditional approach of like buried networks. So in this way, you know, the rainwater is considered as a resource. It's no longer a problem. You know, there is water. So leave the water and use the water as a resource. You know, it could be a permanent basin for watering, you know, green spaces and gardening areas. And we actually did those corridors from the wetland all the way to the, the coastal side where the water actually drains naturally and you create those walking corridors with you know, green and um, blue lines, use trees so that they can provide actually natural barrier against heat, anticipate the sort of plants that we will need so that we can start um, before we even start building, producing these plants and it creates jobs as we do that. Um, also look at how we can um, position our buildings so that we can reduce the expenditure in terms of energy um, and use a type of architecture that is particularly adapted to the, the climate there. Um, in terms even of the materials, the construction materials that we use. So for example, there is a team that is currently working on um, the um, bricks that can be used, that can be done and looking at the exact composition of the bricks based on the environment where we are so that um, we can actually even build without having to put AC or at least to put AC all the time so that therefore you're reducing the, your, um, 
you're improving the energy efficiencies of, of what you're doing and you're reducing the, the maintenance and, and the, the bill of like, you know, having to pay for electricity bills that we can't, I mean, it's, it's when you think about it in the buildings where we are, why are we all living in AC or we can't even pay our electricity bills? It, it, it's just, it just doesn't make sense. I mean, some of th these are some of the things that we started questioning. Um, and therefore involve the research community in developing solutions that can be prototyped and tested there. Um, and I emphasize on the word prototyped because innovation means that some of it will not work. Um, and it's important to measure. When you talk about a smart city, um, what is a smart city? It's, it's because you're collecting data so that you know what works, what doesn't work, and you can be agile enough to say, okay, this I can, you know, scale. Um, okay, this, this, is a, this is a very good solution for energy efficiency. Let's deploy it at a, on a greater scale. And actually, no, this one doesn't work. Let's stop it quickly so that it doesn't, it doesn't become a money drain. Um, and in doing so, um, you're actually involving the local authorities and, and training them in how um, they can manage a city and make it in a cost if effective way. Um, and they get involved as well in the solutions that are being developed. So I'm, I'm saying all this because the overall um, economy, the overall cost of the project is something that we have constantly in mind. Um, for every technical solution that um, we're thinking of implementing, uh, we have to find the right cost. We have to find the right business model for it. Um, and this is where um, it's a very interesting structure for startups because this is what they do. Um, they are testing their business models and they're actually having the opportunity to come and test it there because most of the time startups have great solutions, but they don't have access to the um, uh, any, any public um, bidding process because they're too small, because they don't meet all the requirements. So doing this through an umbrella of R&D in the first phases before they can say, okay, we have a solution that works and they can um, do it at a larger scale at CMSC or elsewhere is a great um, opportunity as well for them. Um, so it's also um, the other um, learning that we, um, that we took um, by, by going through this approach is that we can go through successes phases. I mean, you know, it, it's, there's a little bit of vanity saying, oh, you know, we're building a city and it, you know, it's gonna be, you know, you will, you will drive by in five years and you'll see all the shiny buildings and, and you know, it gives a sense of, you know, we're doing something. Um, the reality is you need to go step by step and we, we are going to do the first eco um, neighborhood, which will only be four hectares. It's the 200 uh, hectares development, but let's do this one and then we'll move to 60 hectares in phase two and then we'll continue building it as we're learning, learning along and making sure that we're doing the right thing. We've seen too many projects in Africa. Um, the so-called white elephants where, you know, you, you see the, the beautiful videos and, uh, you know, the, the uh, 3D, um, like, it's showing you what the city will be like. And then sometimes they even build it and there is no one in there because maybe it didn't make sense. Maybe it was too expensive. They couldn't finish. So we're, we really do not want to be in that situation. And this is why we're phasing it and we're going, and maybe it's a little bit slower, um, but we feel that we're doing the right thing in enabling the prototyping and the incubation of the solutions um, that can really have an impact. Um, one of the things that we've started doing, even before even finalizing the, the, the new master plan is is to um, start having um, experimentation demonstrators in the city. Um, so we have um, a house that is using eco materials and renewable energy so we can compare um, the, um, if, if you want how it performs versus a normal one. Um, there is also a waste management system that we're already putting in place for the collection, the processing, and the sale of household waste, especially plastics. 
so they can be recycled. Um, actually, there is, we're in discussion to um, have a, um, a factories that will build a recycled bricks um, using um, plastics. Um, and it's, uh, it's a project that we're doing with UNICEF actually. Um, we're also looking at um, the city hall. Um, we're putting a, an autonomous uh, mixed solar and wind energy solution there to see if it improves energy efficiency. Um, there's another project about using um, uh, batteries um, for various uses, including mobility, household energy um, um, consumption by the population. So. Um, we're we're starting to put these small things so that you know when you talk when you when you go talk to the population and say oh we're going to build you know an innovation city they don't even know what innovation is but they innovate every day this is a funny thing right um, because they 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 come up with very um, innovative solutions in their day to day lives which are um, maybe not. Um, under a name of, um, we don't call it innovation, but it is. And this is also some of the, the local initiatives that we want to make sure that they are valued, that um, if we can reinforce them, we do. Um, if we can bring financing where there is need for financing, if we can bring training when there is need for training, we do that. So basically what CMSC is, is turning into um, is it's a living lab where innovative sustainable infrastructure solutions can be tested even um even before um the the you know the the total master plan for the 200 hectares is um is is finalized and mm -hmm. and and maybe that new way of uh, we are treating this project a little bit as a as a as a startup itself you know, when you, the first thing they teach you when you're, um, when you're in innovation and you do a startup is, you know, do your proof of concept. And then once you've done your proof of concept, then you can scale. And this is what we're doing. Um, you, you asked me about, uh, the question was, uh, an, ex, an experimentation and, and this is what it is. And, um, we're in the middle of it. Um, we're, you know, we've moved from the theory to the, the first implementations of it. Um, so there is, um, it's not easy um, because um, the systems to raise even funding, the first thing they ask you is where's your master plan? Where are your studies? Where, and, and, you know, sometimes we have to say, well, you know, we haven't completed the master plan for the 200 hectares, so we don't qualify sometimes for funding. Um, so we have to come to a, a, a happy medium where we can also have something that re reassures our investors that we're doing the right thing. Um, but it's a, it's a very interesting um, experiment and it's one where we feel that we're doing something that hasn't been done, um, at least in, um, in Sub-Saharan Africa and where we really um, want to make sure that we are focusing on creating impact, creating value, creating jobs and, um, and impacting people's lives every day. So Great, I'll stop there. I don't know if, uh, if there are questions and I haven't oh. checked the chat, but... <laughs> Great. No, thanks, Claude. Um, so I guess it's clear why I asked you to be on the panel, because we really needed a grounded example to illustrate some of the points that have been made before. Um, and I guess a question I'd like to bring back to Stefan later on um, is, you know, how do we think of the infrastructure investment landscape so that a proportion of these project budgets can support these kinds of initiatives at the city scale? Because if we don't have a proliferation of these R&D living labs across the continent in these cities to figure out the specificities of landscape, of history, of affordability, and et cetera, et cetera, you know, these big plans are never going to be implemented. You know, they're going to be plans for the shelf. So I think we kind of need this interesting dialectic between the macro plans and the city level uh, sort of action plans. And maybe we can come back about to sort of, because I think one of our collective challenges is to figure out how do we finance that kind of research, right? Uh, that that uh, Claude was, was uh, 
uh, expressing you, you want me to 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 to, to not now, now or not come back. i just want to give go straight on okay. to leslie and just to indicate um to to claude that there might be some comments while you were speaking that you want to just look at and we can return to so of course um when I spoke to some colleagues a couple of years ago in the insurance industry, uh, this person was telling me that only 3% of, well, at, at their estimate, this was a big South African insurance company, only 3% of urban assets are insured across Africa. I don't know if that's true, but it kind of sounds like, uh, like one of those numbers that just blows your mind. Um, and uh, and of course, one of the constraints we have to get infrastructure finance to go after the right kinds of approaches in the way that Claude was talking about it, um, labor intensive, doesn't mimic Singapore, tries to do something that is contextually relevant, is that often those things are not considered viable business cases. You know, they're often seen as too risk uh, uh, um, intensive. And so, uh, Leslie, I was hoping hoping you can share with us uh, your perspective on, on, on how do we re possibly think about redefining risk as part of de-risking African cities for the future. Leslie, thank you for being here and the floor is yours. Well, uh, thank you very much, Edgar, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone that's tuned in. Uh, I would like to structure my remarks along five lines. Uh, the first one will be uh, based around sort of what we need, you know, the, the problem and the potential solution. And uh, I am happy that I've gone last because I've been able to integrate the input from my fellow participants as well. The second point that I'll tackle is uh, just the principles of insurance, uh, what it is, how it works, and why it's important for the discussion that we're having today. The third uh, part of my talk will be around the products that uh, the insurance industry has. The fourth will be around uh, how insurance companies invest their assets, because insurance companies are major institutional uh, investors uh, around the world. And then finally, I'll talk about the enablers to uh, unlock this uh, investment potential that uh, I would have uh, shared with you. So uh, maybe just to start from the beginning, I think based on the conversation we're having now, we all broadly agree that there is inadequate urban infrastructure in, in Africa. And unless we speed up the pace of investment, the problem is going to get uh, worse. When you look at a typical city, you know, like the one that I live in, in Nairobi, is a city that was uh, designed originally for a million people but now we have 5 million people living within the city and it's really stretched in, in, every, sense of the in, in every sense of the word. Uh, getting from point A to point B at, at rush hour leads to people losing uh, an hour or two per day, which has a significant economic uh, cost. Uh, Adlam talked about the uh, investment needs of, of Africa, you know, 50 to 60 billion per year. And the uh, important question to answer is, how do we start to fund uh, those, those needs, especially given the uh, global investor scarceness about Africa? COVID-19 would have had a negative impact on risk appetite and with investors uh, taking a step back and not deploying uh, capital in ventures that are seen to be, uh, to be risky. And then also, uh, as my fellow panelists have outlined, at, uh, in Africa, we have the opportunity to leapfrog, given the fact that we are not dealing with some of the intractable legacy issues that we see in the more developed uh, cities. But we cannot just copy and paste what's been done in other places. We need to design solutions from the ground up that are fit for purpose in the African uh, context. And then finally, I think what is extremely important for me is that uh, what we're discussing today, you know, resilience, sustainability, all those are not political uh, ideologies, but they are founded on sound economic principles. Because if we make our decisions based on political ideology, we'll simply not, uh, not succeed. And then to talk about what insurance is, I think insurance is a resilience and solidarity 
uh, mechanism where the claims of the many, uh, the claims of the few rather, are paid by the premiums of the, of the many. And this allows uh, the solidarity framework to, uh, to, to develop, where if somebody's house burns down, the people whose houses have not burnt down effectively contribute uh, to the reconstruction of the, of the house. And the uh, presence of the solidarity mechanism allows uh, people, entrepreneurs, to go out and be able to take on risk. Most importantly, uh, the African insurance market is connected to the global insurance market through the reinsurance uh, mechanism. As a result, some of the uh, risks that we face uh, in Africa, particularly related to urban infrastructure, can be transferred uh, to the global markets, which is more diversified and this lowers the cost of, uh, of, of, of capital. So these principles are, are extremely important when we think about uh, the infrastructure needs of Africa going forward. On the specific products uh, side, you can think of uh, a typical product like flood uh, insu insurance. This would allow uh, a city to bounce back uh, if it was ever uh, uh, fl flooded. As you know, uh, most of the large cities in, in, in Africa face some natural catastrophe risks, be it uh, flooding, uh, be it earthquakes, uh, or uh, landslides and, and so forth. So therefore, by having insurance, we allow sort of the construction to continue. And if there's ever an event, then there is a mechanism that allows the city to regenerate uh, itself. When you then think about maybe the financial engineering side of things, uh, the insurance products for uh, political risk. So if there are some investors that are concerned uh, that reg regulation in Africa will change, they will not be able to co convert their currencies insurance companies can step in and take on that risk, uh, allowing investors to accept the risk that they're most uh, comfortable uh, with. And this process allows the crowding in of uh, investors and also investors that would otherwise think Africa is uh, too risky uh, can uh, uh, part participate. Uh, while we're talking about urban areas specifically, it's also important to think about uh, building resilience in agriculture through uh, insurance, because as you have this rural to urban migration, there are fewer people that are left farming the, the land. And at the same time, you have more people living in the cities that need access to cheap and nutritious uh, food. So there has to be a mechanism uh, that allows uh, people uh, to, uh, have a more secure food for uh, food uh, source and uh, insurance plays a very important uh, role uh, there. And finally, you know, when we talk about all the various risks that go, uh, go into uh, an infrastructure project, if you use insurance to uh, reduce uh, that risk, you are almost by definition making the project more bankable, more likely to be funded and uh, therefore uh, more likely to be you know, to be realized and then this goes uh, towards solving this uh, 50 to 60 billion uh, funding need uh, that we have and then maybe moving on to the fourth point about how insurance companies invest their own uh, balance sheets insurance companies are major institutional investors uh, you know globally they control close to three trillion dollars uh, and they're uh, big investors in the fixed income space. So if you have a capital structure for an infrastructure project where you would have your equity, your MES, and your, and your senior debt, the banks can originate the debt and then securitize it out to, the, uh, to allow institutional investors to uh, participate. Without this securitization uh, function, then the size of the project that you can take on depends on the ability of the banks uh, to lend. And if you're looking at a domestic only uh, source of uh, financing, then you will be, uh, uh, you, the size of your project will be then tied to the size of your banking industry or how much of their collective balance sheet 
they are, they are uh, willing to, uh, uh, to, to put at, at risk for a specific uh, transaction. By also by creating these secondary instruments you know, for financing infrastructure like fixed income bonds, you are also bringing in additional investors which should lower the cost of capital. If you think about it, if you are running a net present value calculation, your cost of capital is an important determinant of whether you have a positive NPV project or you have a negative NPV project, which then determines whether the project gets uh, uh, realized or not. So lowering your cost of capital through some of these mechanisms is uh, uh, extremely uh, important. And then uh, as the insurance companies participate in the local uh, uh, markets, uh, in the local financial markets, then you have also a deepening of the uh, local financial markets which then creates a sustainable long-term domestic uh, funding uh, source. I have talked about the sort of first loss uh, trans, uh, uh, st uh, structures, and we already see this being uh, implemented by organizations such as ATI, the African Trade Insurance, uh, by uh, uh, Stefan and his colleagues at the African uh, Development uh, Bank uh, as well. Maybe for purely selfish reasons, uh, as an insurer, I'm interested in uh, resilience because it means that you lower the cost of claims over the, over, long, over the long haul. So therefore, if you are building smart and uh, uh, resilience is something that is a feature of the uh, projects and is not you know, retrofitted as an, after, as an after, uh, thought then this lowers the claims uh, uh, in, the, uh, in, the long, in, the, in the in the long run. And then, uh, obviously, not everyone will agree on, on this, but uh, private sector, uh, the private sector funding for infrastructure projects is important because the government cannot by itself meet all the uh, infrastructure needs. So there is a role for the private sector to, uh, to play. And in some instances, the private sector can deliver projects at a much lower cost uh, than, the, uh, than the government because the investors are uh, more focused on de delivering a low cost uh, project because then it ultimately affects uh, all their, their return on, uh, on, on, on investment. And this is a much bigger issue for investors that are seeking a return than it is for a government that is trying to provide uh, infrastructure to its citizens as part of a social contract or as part of an electoral man, uh, uh, man, mandate. And uh, also uh, loading the government balance sheet with uh, debt, uh, as uh, Stefan was uh, alluding to, is also not a, a sustainable long-term solution because this, this debt needs to be uh, paid back through taxation and there's obviously a limit on how much the government can be able to spend on debt service. And then finally, you know, what are the enablers that are required uh, to uh, raise all this uh, funding that we talked about from the insurance industry in, in particular, but also from the private sector at large? Uh, regulation is obviously a, a, a key point, specifically on the insurance side. How insurance, co how insurance companies invest is uh, determined to a large degree by the uh, insurance regulators. And uh, usually in Africa, you have this uh, disconnect where on the one hand, the government wants uh, the insurance industry to play a much bigger role in financing infrastructure, while on the other hand, the insurance, the insurance regulators are, are less uh, keen and have punitive capital charges levied investments that are made in, uh, in infrastructure. So if we all agree that this is a serious problem that we need to solve, then there needs to be much greater alignment between the various arms of, 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 of government. And this is not to say it should be uh, an open buffet as it were, but I think there is space to move the needle while remaining within the bounds of, of prudence. And uh, then uh, stick, sticking with the theme of, of, of regulation, I think at the national level, there should be an, uh, a welcoming uh, 
legislative framework that allows the enforcement of, of contracts uh, with investors, that uh, allows for prudent management of exchange rates, because then if you're raising money internationally in US dollars, in pounds or in euros, you're deploying it uh, locally, then you face a huge risk on the currency side from devaluation or from failing to get authorization to remit the funds back to your uh, investors. Again, all these issues need to be thought about holistically and the legislative framework should uh, really uh, pull in the same uh, in the same direction. Governance is an obvious one. Uh, planning, uh, having uh, the right policies, having national strategy are also uh, obvious uh, points that need to be uh, tackled. And maybe uh, finally, uh, they should be also a storytelling. All of these uh, initiatives should not be seen as sort of isolated ad hoc points, but should be much, should be part of the broader uh, compared of what the government is trying to do. I was really encouraged, you know, listening to uh, uh, Claude's present, uh, presentation about, uh, you know, the 200 hectare project, uh, project, how it links with uh, environmental concerns, how it links with the neighboring uh, country, uh, and also with, uh, with, with Cotonou, because then this becomes part of an overarching narrative that uh, uh, investors uh, can 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 buy can buy into and, uh, and 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 support because again this burden cannot be entirely borne by the national uh, government. So uh, with these uh, uh, short remarks, uh, I will stop here, and I'm happy to get additional comments uh, from my co-panelists and also take some questions from the uh, listeners. Thank you. Thanks, Leslie. And uh, I just, you know, having been uh, in these Pan-African conversations on urban development over the last decade or more, I'm just struck by the fact that this is literally the first time I think that there's someone from the insurance industry uh, bringing that perspective into the debate. And it's obviously clearly a fundamental component of the financing and institutional arrangement side of things. So, so thanks for, the, for engaging and I, I hope that uh, we can broaden this even more in the future. Um, so before I give um, uh, uh, Claude uh, an opportunity to respond, if she wishes to, to some of the comments in the chat box, um, uh, one of the participants, Azade Sobut, uh, if that's the correct pronunciation, has put up a hand to, to ask a question or make a contribution. Uh, Azade, if you're still in the conversation. Uh, oh, sh uh, the person has disappeared, says the, the chat moderator. Okay, so we took too long to get to uh, that specific person. Please raise your hand. Uh, um, Alma, my colleague who's moderating the chat, uh, she'll be able to see and then draw my attention to it. Um, uh, Stefan, there's also been one or two specific questions towards you. Uh, Leslie, a question has just come in for you, um, but Claude, do you maybe want to kick us off with some reflections or responses? You on mute. Hi, sorry. Um, there was a question about the timing um, of the project, and it's a very interesting one um, because it's not linear. Um, what we've done, and remember, as I started saying, this is not just an infrastructure project because we have programs and because we've already have some um, academic institutions and research centers and um, entrepreneurship programs um, that are going on. We actually build um, not on the site because the site doesn't have servicing yet, but we will actually build a prototype building um, where I am sitting in, we actually moved in here um, two weeks ago. Um, that's why the, the walls are all white because we haven't yet put anything on the walls yet. But, um, and this building is actually a prototype of what you would find in Seme City. The, the ground floor is for entrepreneurs, making it simple. The second floor is for all the classrooms and the third floor is for research centers. And on the rooftop, we have all the um, uh, restoration facilities. And this is teaching us a lot 
um, in terms of energy efficiencies, in terms of data collection, in terms of um, the interaction between the different groups. And actually some people working here are working on solutions for SEME. So when we're asked, when do you start? We've, we've actually started because we this this building is a prototype um, of what um, we will build over there. Um, so in terms of being in SEME, as I said, there's some little experimentation that have already started. Um, and our aim is to be able to do the um, um, back to school, um, the so start the school year 2022 in SEME. So um, that gives us about 18 months to get there. Um, and at least start with the first, um, the first set of buildings and have all the servicing work being done and everything. So that was on the timing. Um, I'm not sure there were any comments. So. That's fine. Um, uh, Stefan, do you perhaps want to come in? And then, oh, so, um, and then uh, Leslie, there was a specific question towards you from Anton Cartwright. But Stefan, uh, do you want to come in? Yes, uh, the, the first, uh, what you were mentioning before the, the presentation of Leslie was uh, this issue of R&D and, and living labs. Um, you know, start, starting this, uh, this division at the bank, at the African Development Bank, we, we actually went to see our colleagues at the, at the Inter-American Development Bank. That's one thing they do down there is city labs. Uh -huh. a small projects, just like, like Claude was talking about, is testing uh, a, a small scale and then scaling it up. Um, I think one of the key messages of this uh, post-COVID uh, 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 issue is to re-centralize cities around the key people and to put the right people at the front stage. For me, my, my humble opinion, and, and I know Benin a little bit because I, I know the, the, His Excellency, the, the Minister of, uh, of Urban Development, well, he was my colleague at the bank. Well, uh, <laughs> you'll say hi to him when you, when you meet him, Claude. Uh, is to putting people like engineers, planners, architects, electricians, gardeners, plumbers, masons at the forefront of city development. I mean, finance, financials and bankers, we are, if you want, we should be at the back of the, of the queue. Maybe also insurers. Uh, we should be back of the queue. The, 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 the key people are those, those the people with the the hands in, in the construction, the hands in the management, the hands in the, in the design, put them back in where they, where they should be. And often when we, and Cities Alliance have done a great uh, analysis of who do we have in municipalities, we have often so few technicians. South Africa is a, is a special case, Edgar, you know it. If you move up north, then you find yourself with municipalities with very few people, very few architects, very few engineers, very few planners. How do we want to do resilient this, sustainable that? I mean, in the case of Benin, the minister himself is an architect. How wonderful, how wonderful. So let's put the technicians back in this, in this design uh, and starting small scale testing, uh, how to use less AC, major issue, how to, uh, the, the, the mayor of Paris has, has launched this 15 minute city. I mean, if you do a 15 minute city, the infrastructure investment that you will have to do on transport could go down seriously. And then you will have actually more of a village feel. You will live not far from where you work, shop, uh, things that are grown not far from where you live, and so on and so forth. You really can actually have sustainable as a real sustainable, not you know, funky sustainable, but get, to, get real. There's a question that's uh, by Barbara Summers. Uh, um, um, specifically to us on uh, on decentralization a decentralized and network infrastructure system uh, saying that uh, instead of doing bulk infrastructure we should actually be more um, um, doing energy and sanitation sanitation uh, it has a more classic model for for more resource constrained cities yes uh, I mean we agree I mean the we can do that at the bank. We can actually uh, provide um, um, resources to, to cities. Then again, they have to meet some conditions, so risk conditions. And right now, not many cities, apart from the metros in, the, in South Africa, where you are, Edgar, or some cities in the north, the, the first league cities, the rest are more complicated unless it is under sovereign loan. And then 
Uh, and as Leslie has mentioned also, we get into all this business of, uh, you know, debt sustainability and all this stuff. So we need to get a lot clever in making sure that the, the cash flow, that, that at least even the small tax, uh, cash flows of the, of, uh, of the cities are actually gaining their coffers. Thank you. Thanks, Stefan. Before I give over to our other panelists to respond, um, we've got a raised hand from Mdududzi Mbada. Uh, if I could ask uh, that person to ask their question or make a comment. Uh, please go ahead, you're still muted. Um, you remain muted. If you could just unmute yourself, please. Um, okay, uh, so from where I can see that the microphone remains muted. So maybe just give you a moment to sort that out and then um, I, I just want to ask any of the other panelists if you want to respond and then we can come back to him to do it. Yeah, uh, uh, Eka, uh, thanks. I, I will respond to the questions that came through the chat about uh, whether we should uh, be innovative in terms of the uh, of, of fundraising. And uh, broadly speaking, I'll say uh, I will say yes because so far uh, countries uh, have generally relied uh, relied on the traditional financiers uh, of infrastructure. But now that you have this crowdfunding uh, platforms, then uh, this uh, money can be raised there, you know, while respecting obviously all the consumer uh, uh, reg regulation, just to make sure that the, the people that are investing have sufficient knowledge of uh, what they're getting themselves uh, into. And uh, the other question was around whether uh, investors confuse unfamiliarity with, uh, with risk? And uh, the short answer is, uh, is yes. But then at the same time, if you're a global investor sitting in, uh, in London, you see you know, hundreds of uh, European uh, deals. So you start to become familiar with how they're structured and how they work, but you only see the occasional African, uh, African deal. And then depending on the size of the deal, there's only so much time you would be willing to spend sort of getting to, uh, uh, to, to understand uh, the deal. Therefore, being able to crowd in domestic uh, investors uh, is extremely uh, important. And you know, this is where the insurance industry would come in because then you'll have at least uh, domestic investors that sort of understand uh, the, the risk. Sort of all these uh, things that I've talked about don't work in isolation, but they rather work, you know, harmoniously as a, as a collective. So you, you need to sort of tackle everything uh, at the same time. But yeah, uh, there is a very strong case that uh, countries need to broaden their, their base of uh, investors and uh, we need to uh, crowd in domestic uh, investors and not just be dependent on international investors. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um... Edlam, did you want to come in on anything? Um, yes, uh, there was a question asked about, um, you know, whether, you know, how is it possible to, to ensure synergy between national and uh, local um, sort of uh, infrastructure prioritization to ensure that they are mutually uh, cohesive? And I think it's, it's really not uh, either or and both are important for one another and I think this is really what what I was uh, referring to how um, I think framing the question of urban infrastructure just at the urban scale as a local agenda as a city scale agenda um, is, is, is not sort of um, sufficient in my opinion we need to recognize that uh, it's important to frame it at the city and the urban scale, but it cannot also be addressed only at the city scale or within sort of the urban sphere. And I think it's a question of looking at how to take advantage of uh, the, the resources and the investments 
in other sectors that may be a, of, of a higher priority for government to be of an advantage to cities as well and to contribute to the functionality of cities. And so you see that there are enormous investments made um, under the, uh, you know, a national infrastructure portfolio or under a national industrialization plan um, or even, uh, you know, policies and strategies for, uh, for trade and regional integration. And within that, integrating a spatial and urban perspective would allow us to think about how do we how do we take advantage of those resources and investments in a way that they also benefit cities and cities can also enable those infrastructure investments to be um, uh, to be uh, better functional and have a higher impact so i think it's about this this symbiosis between you know the urban sector and then everything else that's happening outside the urban sector i think we can agree that there are a lot of other sectors that our national governments prioritize over and above urban and uh, we can also agree that it's it's often you know the ministry of housing and urban development and local development you know is not as prominently positioned as other sectors in government so really it's about uh, making a much stronger case for this sector to also be considered at an equal if not a more central level uh, of importance for uh, economic transformation. The other point I want to make is really about prioritization. I thought we've referred to it uh, in this conversation, but I think it's, it's super key. I mean, that's, that's the question on the table. How do you prioritize? The needs are many, the challenges are many, the gaps are huge, the financing needs are immense. And so what, what kind of prioritizing, prioritization metrics are we applying as we identify infrastructure investments at the city scale and beyond the city scale? I think there's so many instances why you wonder why a road is being built as opposed to an investment being made in public transport. I mean, let's think about the public transport question. And it goes back to what someone, someone said earlier, is it cheap? It's not cheap. But then what would be the benefits and what are the costs we face today because of the weak public transport systems that we have? And I think this is a particular case where it may not be within the capacities of a local government to resolve such a fundamental challenge at the city scale. Yet, if the functionality and productivity of a city is considered not just at the city scale, but in terms of what it means for industrialization, what it means for agriculture transformation, perhaps this will be prioritized. Perhaps public transport will, get, will gain more prominence in national agendas, in national infrastructure um, plans and strategies. So I think this is the kind of convergence that um, I, I, I was referring to earlier. And I, and I really want to, uh, I think, support and align myself with what Leslie said earlier around, you know, an overarching compelling strategic narrative. And this is perhaps sometimes uh, what we may be missing when it comes to uh, infrastructure investments and uh, infrastructure prioritization in our countries and where urban sits within that overarching compelling strategic uh, narrative. Over to you. Thanks. Um, on that last point, to maybe just draw attention to work that ACC did with the Coalition for Urban Transitions in Tanzania and Ghana, where we were working with a network of local stakeholders um, to, in, in a lab format to precisely figure out what that narrative could be and what are the linkages that one could draw to rethinking macroeconomic policy. So for example, in Tanzania, um, we were able to do some macroeconomic modeling to look at what's the growth and the jobs implications if you choose uh, sustainable infrastructure over the conventional approach and so forth. And those kind of econometric modeling then speaks in a language that is helpful for, um, for national decision makers and people in the ministries of finance and economic development and so on. So, but absolutely, but I think you know, it has to be in a dynamic way and it has to be in processes that brings these different actors together. Um, a question I have uh, to, to, I guess, uh, Stefan and Edlam, to, to you and maybe Leslie, you have a view on it as well. If we look at the sort of Pan-African um, projects, the 16 big infrastructure projects that sit as a political expression or infrastructure expression of Agenda 2063 um, in terms of the implementation plan and so on, um, how do, you know, that for, as far as I can tell from sort of reviewing those plans and so on, they, they have no subnational conception to them at all. You know, they kind of just connect these enormous geographies to each other. 
And I was curious if that presumably is picking up an enormous amount of, of, of resources in its wake and it has a lot of political prestige and, and clout and so on. How do we get cities and local authorities and subnational governments into those planning processes and implementation processes and so forth? And how do we make sure that they can be adapted to meet some of the local uh, strategic development imperatives. Um, so that was one very specific question I thought both of you may be in a good position to reflect on. And the second one is this point that has emerged in the conversation around uh, capacity. So that's obviously a very lumpy word and often it kind of hides more than it reveals. But what we do know is that one, we've got a net shortage of professionals across the full spectrum of the disciplines. But then also often those who we do have is typically part of the problem and not helping us innovate. You know, they kind of have a vested interest to just reproduce the status quo. So, so, so this issue of producing more professionals that are really equipped to read and analyze and work with the context in this emergent way that Claude was uh, elaborating on, uh, but also growing the numbers, right? I mean, how are we going to achieve that? Have you got any thoughts on how we can raise the level of investment in professional development, in training, in capacity development, uh, and so on? So, so those are sort of just two questions that have really stood out for me from listening to your inputs across the different uh, perspectives. Stefan, do you maybe want to kick off first? Well, uh, lady, ladies first, if you want to uh, add them, you can go first. Um, okay, <laughs> I, I'll, 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 I'll touch on two points. One is on this capacity building. Um, I, before joining the, the, the bank, I, I had a life before uh, working in government um, and, then, and then private sector and consulting. And you realize that, uh, the, and you can see that in South Africa, for example, where, where, where you are, the quality of the infrastructure is a direct relationship or the quality of the or the authority or the or the institution that actually um, executes the infrastructure and maintains the infrastructure. I, I haven't seen a country where the rural authority, for example, was really weak, but the the, the highway was incredibly good quality. That country hasn't been born yet. Uh, generally, if the road is in poor shape, the rural authority is is actually a poor a poor strength. So. Uh, so once, if you accept that particular link, then the capacity of the city to manage, and you can see you're in Cape Town, you have great capacity at the municipality, Joburg has capacity and so on and so forth. And then you go to big cities like Nairobi, which didn't have too much capacity. And then uh, Leslie was talking about uh, for many, many years, it didn't have infrastructure growth. So governments and, and the bank will help. I mean, our, we are here to, to support uh, our, our, our sovereigns uh, and, and are now also sub-sovereign need to build up the capacity of, of municipalities. Uh, 50 years, 60 years after independence, we are still running sometimes in old regulations from colonial times and so on and so forth, on top of a very few people on, this is done. We had, COVID has shown us really that that's just, we need to change that, that deal. Uh, there, there was another question, Edgar, that uh, um, a lady uh, asked, um, her name is uh, Fatima Faruta. Actually, it's, it's a bit towards Claude, but I, it's about the informal sector mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in crafting national policy. Here again, uh, uh, the, the post-COVID, we, we are now in this recovery, recovery phase of post-COVID. It's going to be long, it's going to be hard, it's going to be difficult. Uh, any country, and especially on the continent, will find it a very tough, a long road to recovery. How do we bring those millions of people into the, into the, the help in, the, in rebuilding better, build back better? And, and I don't have the solution in my, in my head, but how to bring the informal sector? Uh, I, could, I, I could mention this in, in her, in her uh, introduction. I think this is maybe, to me, is one of the key, one of, one of the solutions on top of the, the big contractors and so on and so forth. So, um, uh, it's we need we need all hands on deck and definitely there's millions of of unemployed informal uh sector which are producing the, the bulk of the employment on the continent 
we need to rope them in, otherwise uh, we'll leave so many people at the other side of the of the road. Back to you, Edgar. Great, thanks. Um, so we 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 at time. So unless uh, uh, Claude or Edlam, you've got one final burning point you have to very quickly make, um, I will close. But yeah, please, if you do, Edlam and Claude. Okay, both of you have thirty seconds. Clock ticking. I'll I'll, I'll, I'll be very quick, Edgar. I I really like the example you picked. The program for infrastructure development. Sixteen huge infrastructure projects planned some ongoing, et cetera, et cetera. This is a classic case where spatial and urban considerations are almost absent or very weak. And so here's a demonstration of how Africa is you know, taking some very critical decisions around infrastructure investments, putting money and resources around that, yet not sufficiently recognizing and responding to and that's what I meant by urban responsive infrastructure yeah. planning. And it, it's just not responding to that. So mm -hmm. that's a really good case. And the other one that we have to think about very critically is the African continental free trade area. Yeah. And so how that, in, that will interact with urban geographies and cities and spatial planning is another key question. Over to you. Great. Claude? Right. Very quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, I just want to say that reading the comments from Fatima on what UNDP is doing and hearing about the CD lab at the um, Africa Development Bank, it's fantastic because five years ago it was lonely to talk about doing experimentation in cities and the fact that we're now getting more and, and, and I have to say even governments need to understand the, import, the importance of experimentation because at the moment it's very even difficult to get um, support and funding for these sort of things because it's quite new and they don't really understand how to treat it. In terms of capacity development, um, I loved the um, what was um, what Stefan said about getting the engineers, the planners, etc., at the forefront. But let's not forget the, the the cleaners, the the gardeners, the the construction workers, because they are really the ones who are going to improve their capacities and their capabilities in building the cities, and that's where we make a difference, even in the informal sector. Um, and and we're really seeing that every day. That's why we we target entrepreneurship because. I mean, 90% of our entrepreneurs are in the informal sector and, and putting together programs like digital artisans, these are really things that start making a difference and raise the bar actually in terms of capabilities for everyone. That was my final word. So thank you very much. That was a very great panel. I really enjoyed it. Fantastic. So just, I'm not going to summarize because we don't have time and I just want to apologize to the two people who have their hands up. Please send us your questions and we'll make sure it gets to the speakers. Um, but just to thank our fantastic panel and unfortunately Leslie had to sign off because he had another commitment at four o'clock. Um, but in his absence and to all of you for being engaged and being very, very clear. Uh, this has greatly enriched our understanding and conversation. Uh, we will, across the five webinars, pull out a set of kind of uh, themes and issues to follow up on, and we want to be quite concrete and pragmatic about next steps. And we look forward to your continued support and participation in this process. So just lastly then to thank my colleague, Alma Vivius, who's made sure the logistics run smoothly. And then our partners, Alfred Harrahaus and Kaszalska, Dark Matters Lab, the Gothenburg Center for Sustainable Development, and finally, Peak Urban. And please join us next week, 2 p.m. again, until 4. And we've got another fantastic group of, of African bright minds, bright things, bright whatever. And uh, we'll have another incredibly engaged conversation. Thanks, everyone. And until next week. Bye-bye. Thank you, Edgar. Thank you, Edlam. Thank you, Flood. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, Edgar. Bye, everyone. Bye. See you.